Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Dave Tobin. Try another way of going live during your broadcast. What is that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're, we're figuring this out as we go. Uh, I think we're okay, so we're going to continue. All watching. Somebody's and watching. Uh, I'm Dave Tobin. This is Maria DeMitchell, Hi. and we're going to read The Lover by Harold Pinter. It's a one-act play. Maria will be reading the stage directions and uh, playing the part of Sarah, and I'll be playing the part of Richard and the Milkman. So, let us begin. Right. The Lover. This is The Lover, written by Harold Pinter in 1962. Summer. A detached house near Windsor. The stage consists of two areas, living room with small hall and front door, bedroom and balcony on a level. There is a short flight of stairs to bedroom door, kitchen off right. A table with a long velvet cover stands against the wall of the living room. In the small hall, there is a cupboard. The furnishings are tasteful, comfortable. Sarah is emptying and dusting ashtrays in the living room. It is morning. She wears a crisp, demure dress. Richard comes into the bedroom from bathroom. He collects his keys, proceeds to the living room, collects his briefcase from hall cupboard, goes to Sarah, kisses her on the cheek. He looks at her a moment, smiling. She smiles. Is your lover coming today? Hmm. What time? Three. Will you be going out or staying in? Oh, I think we'll be staying in. I thought you wanted to go to that exhibition. I did, yes. But I think I'd prefer to stay in with him today. Mm-hmm. Well, I must be off. Richard goes to Hall and puts on his bowler hat. Will he be staying long, do you think? Mm. About six, then? Yes. Have a pleasant afternoon. Bye-bye. Mm. Bye. He opens the front door and goes out. She continues dusting. The lights fade. Fade up. Early evening. Sarah comes into room from kitchen. She wears the same dress, but is now wearing a pair of very high-heeled shoes. She pours a drink and sits on chaise lounge with magazine. There are six chimes of the clock. Key in the front door, Richard enters. He wears a sober suit as in the morning. He puts his briefcase down in the hall and goes into the room. She smiles at him and pours him a whiskey. Hello. Hello. He kisses her on the cheek, takes glass, hands her the evening paper, and sits down. She sits on chaise lounge with paper. Thanks. He drinks, sits back, and sighs with contentment. Oh. Tired. Just a little. Bad traffic? No, quite good traffic, actually. Oh, good. Very smooth. Seemed to me you were just a little late. Am I? Just a little. <clears throat> there was a little bit of a jam on the bridge. Sarah gets up, goes to drink table to collect her glass, sits again on the chaise lounge. Pleasant day. Mm, I was in the village this morning. Oh, yes? See anyone? Not really, no. Had lunch. In the village? Yes. Any good? Quite fair. What about this afternoon? Pleasant afternoon? Oh, yes. Quite marvellous. Your lover came, did he? Hmm, there he has. Did you show him the hollyhocks? The hollyhocks? Yes. No, I didn't. Oh. Should I have done? No, no, it's simply that I seem to remember you're saying he was interested in gardening. Hmm, yes, he is. Not all that interested, actually. Ah. Did you get out at all, or did you stay in? We stayed in. Ah. He looks up at the Venetian blinds. That blind hasn't been put up properly. Yes, it is a bit crooked, isn't it? Very sunny on the road. Of course, by the time I got onto it, the sun was beginning to sink. But I imagine it was quite warm here this afternoon. It was warm in the city. Was it? Pretty stifling. I imagine it was quite warm everywhere. Quite a high temperature, I believe. Did it say so on the wireless? I think it did, yes. <clears throat> I see you had the Venetian blinds down. We did, yes. The light was terribly strong. It was awfully strong. 
The trouble with this room is that it catches the sun so directly when it's shining. You didn't move to another room? No, we stayed here. Must have been blinding. It was. That's why we put the blinds down. The thing is, it gets so awfully hot in here with the blinds down. Would you say so? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's just that you feel hotter. Yes, that's probably it. What did you do this afternoon? Long meeting. Rather inconclusive. It's a cold supper. Do you mind? Not in the least. I didn't seem to have time to cook anything today. Sarah moves towards the kitchen. Oh, by the way, I rather want to ask you something. What? Does it ever occur to you that while you're spending the afternoon being unfaithful to me, I'm sitting at a desk going through balance sheets and graphs? What a funny question. No, I'm curious. You've never asked me that before. I've always wanted to know. Well, of course it occurs to me. Oh, it does. Hmm. What's your attitude to that then? It makes it all the more piquant. Does it really? Of course. You mean while you're with him, you actually have a picture of me sitting at my desk going through balance sheets? Only at certain times. Of course. Not all the time. Well, naturally. At particular moments. Mm. But, in fact, I'm not completely forgotten. Not by any means. That's rather touching, I must admit. How could I forget you? Quite easily, I should think. But I'm in your home. With another. But it's you I love. I beg your pardon? But it's you I love. He looks at her, proffers his glass. Let's have another drink. She moves forward. He withdraws his glass, looks at her shoes. What shoes are they? Hmm? Those shoes, they're unfamiliar, very high-heeled. Mistake, sorry. Sorry? I beg your pardon? I'll take them off. Not quite the most comfortable shoes for an evening at home, I would have thought. She goes into hall, opens cupboard, puts high-heeled shoes into cupboard, puts on low-heeled shoes. He moves to drinks table, pours himself a drink. She moves to center table, lights a cigarette. So you had a picture of me this afternoon, did you, sitting in my office? I did, yes. Wasn't a terribly convincing one, though. Oh, no, why not? Because I knew you weren't there. I knew you were with your mistress. Was I? Aren't you hungry? I had heavy lunch. Oh, how heavy. He stands at the window. What a beautiful sunset. Weren't you? <laughs> what mistress? Oh, Richard. No, no, it's simply the word that's so odd. Is it? Why? I'm honest with you, aren't I? Why can't you be honest with me? But I haven't got a mistress. I'm very well acquainted with a whore, but I haven't got a mistress. There's a world of difference. A whore? <clears throat> yes, just a common or a garden slut. Not worth talking about, handy between trains, nothing more. You don't travel by train, you travel by car. Quite. A quick cup of cocoa while they're checking the oil and water. Sounds utterly sterile. No. I must say, I never expected you to admit it so readily. Oh, why not? You've never put it to me so bluntly before, have you? Frankness at all cost. Essential to a healthy marriage, don't you agree? Of course. I mean, you're utterly frank with me, aren't you? Utterly. About your lover? I must follow your example. Thank you. Yes, I have suspected it for some time. Have you really? Hmm. Perceptive. But, quite honestly, I can't really believe she's just what you say. Why not? It's just not possible. You have such taste. You care so much for grace and elegance in women. And wit. And wit, yes. <coughs> wit, yes. Terribly important. Wit for a man. Is she witty? <laughs> These terms don't apply. You can't simply inquire whether a whore is witty. It's of no significance whether she is or she isn't. 
She's simply a whore, a functionary who either pleases or displeases. And she pleases you? Today, she is pleasing. Tomorrow, one can't say. Richard moves towards the bedroom door, taking off his jacket. I must say, I find your attitude towards women rather alarming. Why? I wasn't looking for your double, was I? I wasn't looking for a woman I could respect, as you, whom I could admire and love as I do you, was I? All I wanted was, how shall I put it? Someone who could express and engender lust cunning with all lust cunning, nothing more. Richard goes into the bedroom, hangs his jacket up in the wardrobe, and changes into his slippers. In the living room, Sarah puts her drink down, hesitates, and then follows into the bedroom. I'm sorry your affair possesses so little dignity. The dignity is in my marriage. Or sensibility. The sensibility likewise. I wasn't looking for such attributes. I find them in you. Why did you look at all? What did you say? Why look elsewhere at all? But, my dear, you looked. Why shouldn't I look? Who looked first? You. I don't think that's true. Who then? The lights fade, fade up. Night, moonlight on balcony. Richard comes in bedroom door in his pajamas. He picks up a book and looks at it. Sarah comes from the bathroom in her nightdress. There's a double bed. Sarah sits at the dressing table, combs her hair. Richard, mm -hmm. do you ever think about me at all when you're with her? Oh, a little, not much. We talk about you. You talk about me with her? Occasionally. It amuses her. How do you talk about me? Delicately. We discuss you as we would play an antique music box. We play it for our titillation whenever desired. I can't pretend the picture gives me great pleasure. It wasn't intended to. The pleasure is mine. <sighs> yes. Of course, I see that. Surely your own afternoon pleasures are sufficient for you, aren't they? They don't, you don't expect extra pleasure from my pastimes, do you? No, not at all. Then why all the questions? Well, it was you who started it, asking me so many questions about my side of things. You don't normally do that. Objective curiosity, that's all. He touches her shoulders. You're not suggesting I'm jealous, surely? She smiles, stroking his hand. Darling. I know you'd never stoop to that. Good God, no. He squeezes her shoulder. What about you? You're not jealous, are you? No. From what you tell me about your lady, I seem to have a far richer time than you. Possibly. He opens the windows fully and stands by them looking out. What peace. Come and look. She joins him at the window. They stand silently. What would happen if I came home early one day, I, I wonder? What would happen if I followed you one day, I wonder? Perhaps we could all meet for tea in the village. Why the village? Why not here? Here? What an extraordinary remark. Your poor lover has never seen the night from this window, has he? No. He's obliged to leave before sunset, unfortunately. Doesn't he get a bit bored with these damn afternoons? This eternal tea time? I would. To have as the constant image of your lust a milk jug and teapot must be terribly dampening. He's very adaptable. And, of course, when one puts the blinds down, it is the sort of evening. Yes, I suppose it is. What does he think of your husband? He respects you. I'm rather moved by that remark in a strange kind of way. I think I can understand why you like him so much. He's terribly sweet. Mm-hmm. Has his moods, of course. Who doesn't? 
But I must say, he's very loving. His whole body emanates love. How nauseating. No. Manly with it, I hope. Entirely. Sounds tedious. Not at all. He has a wonderful sense of humour. Oh, jolly good. Makes you laugh, does he? Well, mind the neighbours don't hear you. The last thing we want is gossip. It's wonderful to live out here, so far from the main road, so secluded. Yes, I do agree. They go back into the room. They get into their bed. He picks up his book and looks at it. He closes it and puts it down. This isn't much good. He switches off his bedside lamp. She does the same. Moonlight. He's married, isn't he? Hmm. Happily? Hmm. And you're happy, aren't you? You're not in any way jealous? No. Good. Because I think things are beautifully balanced, Richard. Lights fade. Fade up. Morning. Sarah putting on her negligee in the bedroom. She begins to make the bed. He enters, fully dressed in his suit, kisses her on the cheek. Bye-bye. He leaves bedroom, collects hat and briefcase from hall. Richard, you won't come home too early today, will you? Do you mean he's coming again today? Good gracious, he was here yesterday. Coming again today? Yes. Oh, no, well, I won't be home early. I'll go to the National Gallery. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. The lights fade. Fade up. Afternoon. Sarah comes downstairs into living room. She wears a very tight, low-cut black dress. She hastily looks at herself in the mirror, suddenly notices she's wearing low-heeled shoes. She goes quickly to cupboard, changes them for her high-heeled shoes, looks again in mirror, smooths her hips, goes to window, pulls Venetian blinds down, opens them and closes them until there is a slight slit of light. There are three chimes of a clock. She looks at her watch, goes towards flowers on the table, doorbell. She goes to door. It is the milkman, John. Crane. You're very late. Crane. No, thank you. Why not? I have some. Do I owe you anything? Mrs. Owen just had three jars. What do, Clotted. I, what do I owe you? It's not Saturday yet. Taking the milk. Thank you. Don't you fancy any cream? Mrs. Owen had three jars. Thank you. She closes the door, goes into the kitchen with milk, comes back with a tea tray, holding teapot and cups, sets it on a small table above Chaise Lounge, crosses her legs, uncrosses them, puts her legs up on Chaise Lounge, smooths her stockings under her skirt. The doorbell rings. Pulling her dress down, she moves to the door, opens it. Hello, Max. Richard comes in. He is wearing a suede jacket and no tie. He walks into the room and stands. She closes the door behind him. Walks slowly down past him and sits on the chaise lounge, crossing her legs. He moves slowly to chaise lounge and stands very close to her at her back. She arches her back uncrosses her legs, moves away to low chair. He looks at her, then moves towards the hall cupboard, brings out a bongo drum. He places the drum on the chaise lounge, stands. She rises, moves past him towards hall, turns, looks at him. He moves below chaise. They sit at either end. He begins to tap the drum. Her forefinger moves along drum towards his hand. She scratches the back of his hand sharply. Her hand retreats. Her fingers tap one after the other towards him and rest. Her forefinger scratches between his fingers. Her other fingers do the same. His legs tauten. His hand clasps hers. Her hand tries to escape. Wild beat of their fingers tangling. Stillness. She gets up, goes to drinks table, lights a cigarette, moves to window. He puts drum down on chair, picks up cigarette, moves to her. Excuse me. She glances at him and away. Excuse me, have you got a light? She does not respond. 
Do you happen to have a light? Do you mind leaving me alone? Why? I'm merely asking if you can give me a light. She moves from him and looks up and down the room. He follows to her shoulder. She turns back. Excuse me? Excuse me? She moves past him, close. His body follows. She stops. I don't like being followed. Just give me a light and I won't bother you. That's all I want. Please go away. I'm waiting for someone. Who? My husband. Why are you so shy, eh? Where's your lighter? He touches her body, an indrawn breath from her. Here? Where is it? He touches her body, a gasp from her. Here? She wrenches herself away. He traps her in the corner. What do you think you're doing? I'm dying for a puff. Her legs strain against his. I'm waiting for my husband. Let me get a light from yours. His hand clasps hers. The hands. They struggle silently. She breaks away to wall. Silence. He approaches. Are you all right, miss? I've just got rid of that gentleman. Did he hurt you in any way? Oh, how wonderful of you. No, no, I'm all right. Thank you. Very lucky I happen to be passing. You wouldn't believe such a thing could happen in this beautiful park. No, you wouldn't. Still, you've come to no harm. I can never thank you enough. I'm terribly grateful. I really am. Why don't you sit down a second and calm yourself? Oh, I'm quite calm. But, yes, thank you. You're so kind. Where shall we sit? Well, we can't sit out. It's raining. What about that park keeper's hut? Do you think we should? I mean, what about the park keeper? I am the park keeper. They sit on the chaise lounge. I never imagined I could meet anyone so kind. To treat a lovely young woman like you like that, it's unpardonable. You seem so mature, so appreciative. Of course. So gentle, so... Perhaps it was all for the best. What do you mean? So that we could meet. So that we could meet, you and I. Her fingers trace his thigh. He stares at them, lifts them off. <clears throat> I don't quite follow you. Don't you? Her fingers trace his thigh. He stares at them, lifts them off. Now look, I'm married. I I'm married. She takes his hand and puts it on her knee. You're so sweet. You mustn't worry. Snatching his hand away. No, I really am. My wife's waiting for me. Can't you speak to strange girls? No. Oh, how sickening you are. How tepid. I'm sorry. You men are all alike. Give me a cigarette. I bloody well won't. I beg your pardon. Come here, Dolores. Oh, no, not me. Once bitten, twice shy. Thanks. Bye-bye. You can't get out, darling. The hut's locked. We're alone. You're trapped. Trapped? I'm a married woman. You can't treat me like this. It's tea time, Mary. She moves swiftly behind the table and stands there with her back to the wall. He moves to the opposite end of the table, hitches his trousers, bends and begins to crawl under the table towards her. He disappears under the velvet cloth. Silence. She stares down at the table. Her legs are hidden from view. His hand is on her leg. She looks about, grimaces, grits her teeth, gasps, gradually sinks under the table and disappears. Long silence. Max! Lights fade, fade up. Max sitting downstage, chair, Sarah pouring tea. Max. What? Darling. What is it? You're very thoughtful. No. You are. I know it. Where is your husband? My husband? You know where he is. Where? He's at work. Poor fellow. Working away all day. I wonder what he's like. <laughs> Max. I wonder if we'd get on. I wonder if we'd, you know, hit it off. I shouldn't think so. Why not? You have very little in common. Have we? He's certainly very accommodating. I mean, he knows perfectly well about these afternoons of ours, doesn't he? Of course. He's known for years. 
Why does he put up with it? Why are you suddenly talking about him? I mean, what's the point of it? It isn't a subject you normally elaborate on. Why does he put up with it? Oh, shut up. I asked you a question. He doesn't mind. Doesn't he? Well, I'm beginning to mind. What did you say? I'm beginning to mind. It's got to stop. It can't go on. Are you serious? It can't go on. You're joking. No, I'm not. Why? Because of my husband? <laughs> not because of my husband, I hope. It's going a little far, I think. No, nothing to do with your husband. It's because of my wife. Your wife? I can't deceive her any longer. Max. I've been deceiving her for years. I can't go on with it. It's killing me. But darling, look, I... Don't touch me. What did you say? You heard. <laughs> but your wife knows, doesn't she? You told her all about us. She's known all the time. No, she doesn't know. She thinks I know a whore. That's all. Some spare time whore. That's all. That's what she thinks. Yes, but be sensible. My love, she doesn't mind, does she? She'd mind if she knew the truth, wouldn't she? What truth? W what are you talking about? She'd mind if she knew that, in fact, I've got a full-time mistress, two or three times a week, a woman of grace, elegance, wit, Imagination? Yes, yes, you have. It's an affair that's been going on for years. She doesn't mind. She, she wouldn't mind. Oh, she's happy. She's happy. I wish you'd stop this rubbish anyway. She picks up the tea tray and moves towards the kitchen. You're doing your best to ruin the whole afternoon. She takes the tea tray out. She then returns, looks at Max and goes to him. Darling. You don't really think you could have what we have with your wife, do you? My, I mean, my husband, for instance, totally appreciates... How does he bear it, your husband? How does he bear it? Doesn't he smell me when he comes back in the more evenings? What does he say? He must be mad. Now, what's the time? Half past four. Now, when he's sitting in his office, knowing what's going on here, how does he feel? How does he... Bear it. Max. How? He's happy for me. He appreciates the way I am. He understands. Perhaps I should meet him and have a word with him. Are you drunk? Perhaps I should do that. After all, he's a man. Like me. We're both men. You're just a bloody woman. She slams the table. Stop it! What's the matter with you? What's happened to you? Please, please stop it. What are you doing? Playing a game? A game? I don't play games. Don't you? You do. Oh, you do. You do. Usually I like them. I played my last game. Why? The children. What? The children. I've got to think of the children. What children? My children. My wife's children. Any minute now, they'll be out of boarding school. I've got to think of them. She sits close to him. I want to whisper something to you. Listen. Let me whisper to you. Hmm? Can I? Please? It's whispering time. Earlier, it was tea time, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Now, it's whispering time. You like me to whisper to you. You like me to love you whispering. Listen. You mustn't worry about wives, husbands, things like that. It's silly. It's really silly. It's you. You now. Here. Here with the me. Here together. That's what it is, isn't it? You whisper to me. You take tea with me. You do that, don't you? That's what we are. That's us. Love me. You're too bony. That's what it is. You see? 
I could put up with everything if it wasn't for that. You're too bony. Me? Bony? Don't be ridiculous. I'm not. How can you say I'm bony? Every move I make, your bones stick into me. I'm sick and tired of your bones. What are you talking about? <clears throat> I'm telling you, you're too bony. But I'm fat. Look at me. I'm plump anyway. You always told me I was plump. You were plump once. You're not plump anymore. Look at me. You're not plump enough. You're nowhere near plump enough. You know what I like? I like enormous women. Like bullocks with udders. Vast, great, uttered bullocks. You mean cows. I don't mean cows. I mean voluminous, great, uttered, feminine bullocks. Once, years ago, you vaguely resembled one. Oh, thank you. But now, quite honestly, compared to my ideal, your skin and bones. They stare at each other. He puts on his jacket. You're having a lovely joke. It's no joke. He goes out. She looks after him. She turns, goes slowly towards bongo drum, picks it up, puts it in the cupboard. She turns, looks at Shays a moment, walks slowly into the bedroom, sits on the end of the bed. The lights fade, fade up, early evening, six chimes of the clock. Richard comes in the front door. He is wearing his sober suit. He puts his briefcase in cupboard, hat on hook, looks about the room, pours a drink. Sarah comes into the bedroom from bathroom, wearing a sober dress. They both stand quite still in the two rooms for a few moments. Sarah moves to the balcony, looks out. Richard comes into the bedroom. Hello. Hello. Watching the sunset. Drink. Not at the moment, thank you. Oh, what a dreary conference. Went on all day, terribly fatiguing. Still, good work done, I think. Something achieved. Sorry I'm rather late. Had to have a drink with one or two of the overseas people. Good chaps. How are you? Fine. Good. You seem a little depressed. Anything the matter? No. What sort of day have you had? Not bad. Not good? Fair. Oh, I'm sorry. Good to be home, I must say. You can't imagine what comfort it is. Lover, come. Sarah? What? Sorry, I was thinking of something. Did your lover come? Oh yes, he came. In good shape? I have a headache, actually. Wasn't he in good shape? We all have our off days. He, too. I thought the whole point of being a lover is that one didn't. I mean, if I, for instance, were called upon to fulfill the function of a lover and felt disposed, shall we say, to accept the job, well, I'd as soon give it up as to be found incapable of executing its proper and consistent obligation. You do use long words. Would you prefer me to use short ones? No, thank you. But I am sorry you had a bad day. It's quite all right. Perhaps things will improve. Perhaps. I hope so. Sarah leaves the bedroom, goes into the living room, lights a cigarette and sits. He follows. Nevertheless, I find you very beautiful. Thank you. Very beautiful. I, I take great pride in being seen with you. When we're out to dinner or at the theater, I'm so glad. Or at the hunt ball. Yes, the hunt ball. Great pride to walk with you as my wife on my arm, to see you smile, laugh, walk, talk, bend, be still, to hear your command of contemporary phraseology, your delicate use of the very latest idiomatic expression, so subtly employed. Yes, to feel the envy of others, their attempts to gain favor with you by fair means or foul, your austere grace confounding them. And to know you are my wife, it's a source of profound satisfaction to me. What's for dinner? I haven't thought. Oh, why not? I find the thought of dinner fatiguing. I prefer not to think about it. That's rather unfortunate. I'm hungry. 
You hardly expect me to embark on dinner after a day spent sifting matters of five finance in the city. <laughs> One could even suggest you were falling down your wifely duties. Oh, dear. I must say, I rather suspected this would happen sooner or later. How's your hall? Splendid. Fatter or thinner? I beg your pardon. Is she fatter or thinner? She gets thinner every day. That must displease you. Not at all. I'm fond of thin ladies. I thought the contrary. Really? Why would you have thought that? Of course, your failure to have dinner on the table is quite consistent with the life you've been leading for some time, isn't it? Is it? Entirely. Perhaps I'm being unkind. Am I being unkind? I don't know. Yes, I am. In the traffic jam on the bridge just now, you see, I came to a decision. Oh, what? That it has to stop. What? Your debauchery. Your life of depravity. Your path of illegitimate lust. Really? Yes, I've come to an irrevocable decision on that point. She stands. Would you like some cold ham? Do you understand me? Not at all. I, I have something cold in the fridge. Too cold, I'm sure. The fact is, this is my house. From today, I forbid you to entertain your lover on these premises. This applies to any time of the day. Is that understood? I've made a salad for you. Are you drinking? Yes, I'll have one. What are you drinking? You know what I drink. We've been married ten years. So we have. It's strange, of course, that it's taken me this long to appreciate the humiliating ignominy of my position. I didn't take my lover ten years ago. Not quite. Not on the honeymoon. That's irrelevant. The fact is, I am a husband who has extended to his wife's lover open house on any afternoon of her desire. I've been too kind. Haven't I been too kind? But of course, you're terribly kind. Perhaps you would give him my compliments, by letter if you like, and ask him to cease his visits from... He consults pocket diary. The 12th. How can you talk like this? Why today? So suddenly? Hmm? You've had a hard day at the office. All those overseas people. It, it's so tiring. But it's silly. It, it's so silly to talk like this. I, I'm here for you. You've always appreciated how much these afternoons m mean. You've always understood. Understanding is so rare, dear. Do you think it's pleasant to know that your wife is unfaithful to you two or three times a week with great regularity? Richard. It's insupportable. It has become insupportable. I'm no longer disposed to put up with it. Sweet Richard, please. Please what? Can I tell you what I suggest you do? What? Take him out into the fields. Find a ditch or a slag heap. Find a rubbish dump, hmm? What about that? Buy a canoe and find a stagnant pond. Anything, anywhere, but not in my living room. I'm afraid that's not possible. Why not? I said it's not possible. But if you want your lover so much, surely that's the obvious thing to do, since his entry to this house is now barred. I'm trying to be helpful, darling, because of my love for you. You can see that. If I find him on these premises, I'll kick his teeth out. You're mad. I'll kick his head in. What about your own bloody whore? I've paid her off. Have you? Why? She was too bony. But you liked. You said you liked. Richard. But you love me. Of course. Yes. You love me. You don't mind him. You understand. I mean, you know better than I do. Darling, all's well. The, the evenings, the afternoons. Listen, I do have dinner for you. It, it's ready. I wasn't serious. It's boeuf à la bourguignon. And tomorrow I'll make chicken chasseur. You would like that? Adulterous.
can't talk like this. It's impossible. You know you can't. What do you think you're doing? He remains looking at her for a second, then moves into hall. He opens the hall cupboard and takes out the bongo drum. She watches him. He returns. What's this? I found it some time ago. What is it? What is it? You shouldn't touch that. But it's in my house. It belongs either to me or to you or to another. It's nothing. I bought it at a jumble sale. It's nothing. What do you think it is? Put it back. Nothing? This? A drum in my cupboard? Put it back. It isn't by any chance anything to do with your illicit afternoons. Not at all. Why should it? It is used. This is used, isn't it? I can guess. You guess nothing. Give it to me. How does he use it? How do you use it? Do you play it while I'm at the office? She tries to take the drum. He holds on to it. They are still hands on the drum. What function does this fulfill? It's not just an ornament, I take it. What do you do with it? You've no right to question me. No right at all. It was our arrangement. No questions of this kind. Please, don't. Don't. It was our arrangement. I want to know. Don't. <clears throat> do you both play it? Mm hmm? Do you both play it together? Oh, stupid. Do you think he's the only one who comes? Do you? Do you think he's the only one I entertain? Don't be silly. I have other visitors. Other visitors all the time. I receive all the time in the afternoons when neither of you know, neither of you. I give them strawberries in season with cream. They come to see the hollyhocks. Strangers, total strangers, but not to me, not while they're here. And then they stay for tea, always. That's so. He moves towards her, tapping the drum gently. He faces her, tapping, then grasps her hand and scratches it across the drum. What are you doing? Is that what you do? She jerks away. He moves towards her, tapping. Like that? What fun. He scratches the drum sharply and then places it on the chair. Got a light? Got a light? She retreats towards the table eventually ending behind it. Come on, don't be a spoiled sport. Your husband won't mind if you give me a light. You look a little pale. Why are you so pale? A lovely girl like you. Don't, don't say that. You're trapped. We're alone. I've locked up. You mustn't do this. You mustn't do it. You he, mustn't. He won't mind. He begins to move slowly closer to the table. No one else knows. No one else can hear us. No one knows we're here. Come on, give us a light. You can't get out, darling. You're trapped. They face each other from opposite ends of the table. I'm trapped. What will my husband say? He expects me, he's waiting. I can't get out. I'm trapped. You've no right to treat a married woman like this, have you? No right at all. Think, think, think of what you're doing. She looks at him, bends, and begins to crawl under the table towards him. She emerges from under the table and kneels at his feet, looking up. Her hand goes up his leg. He is looking down at her. You're very forward. You really are. Oh, you really are. My husband will understand. My husband does understand. Come here. Come down here. I'll explain. After all, think of my marriage. He adores me. It's whispering time. Come here and I'll whisper it to you. It's whispering time, isn't it? She takes his hands. He sinks to his knees with her. They are kneeling together close. She strokes his face. It's a very late tea, isn't it? But I think I like it. Aren't you sweet? I've never seen you before after sunset. You look different. My husband's at a late night conference. Why are you wearing this strange suit and this tie? 
You usually wear something else, don't you? Take off your jacket. Hmm? Would you like me to change? Would you like me to change my clothes? I'll change for you, darling, shall I? Would you like that? Yes. Change. Change. Change your clothes. You lovely whore. There still, kneeling, she leaning over him. The end. <laughs> Thanks for listening in. Yeah, this is for Auburn Public Theater. Thank you so much. And support your Auburn Public Theater. Especially during this quarantine time. Yes. Good night. Good night.